Hello everyone and welcome back to the Warbird Mistress. This video is going to be a little bit different. I know I usually put my slides together and you know have everything done with videos and whatnot, but this is going to be a, just a speaking video. Now part of it is because I just got back from holidays for two weeks and I just really didn't have time to do much. The laptop I had with me was not really set up for any sort of video production, put it that way. So if you see me looking down a little bit, then that's probably just because my notes are right at the top of the screen and uh, that's it. But first I want to give a shout out to those who have purchased merchandise, uh, but definitely to my Patreon patrons, um, still at five, but you know, I really do hope that what I've put together is appreciated and every single little dollar helps, um, whether with software costs or just the miscellaneous running of a, of a website and web series. So. In fact, including merchandise, I have my mug here. It is my only mistress, it is the Warbird mistress, and uh, these are just being added to the store probably this week. Um, I'm also apologize for my appearance or my sound. I'm using a webcam that uh, was a technology I don't think I've used since graduate school. So, moving forward, the French Air Force, the Armée de l'Air, is I mean, it just gets so much criticism from everyone, and Nobody really looks at why it failed to perform well. I mean, the Luftwaffe did pay dearly for invading uh, France, and it wasn't an easy campaign for many of their pilots. The French did put up a fight, and just like in Poland, there were a lot of German losses. But when we really look back in the past at the way the French approached air power, they kind of sat on their laurels for a long time. And when they did have to modernize, you know, they really just didn't have the drive to innovate. They had way too many budgetary restrictions. Um, their politics were really bad. Um, and, you know, they just didn't have the wherewithal to promote aviation as a part of their national defense. So budgetary restrictions, I think we could all understand coming from the 20s and the 30s. It's just something that's there. You have the depression, you have in France, the aftermath from the Great War was tremendous. Um, and then they're building the Maginot Line and their naval expansion plans cost a lot of money and resources. Aviation wasn't really you know, at the top of their priorities, especially because of the way that aviation was seen as a part of the coming war. So now before I get into this, I do want to recommend three volumes that I read, say, over the last two years or so. And... You know, these definitely help to write this because a lot of this is going to be kind of off the top of my head. But they're uh, Greg Bond's uh, The Rise and Fall of the French Air Force, French Air Operations and Strategy, 1900 to 1940. Um, his Rise of the Bomber, that's uh, RAF Army Planning, 1919 to Munich, 1938. And uh, John Sutherland and Diane Canwell's Vichy Air Force at War, the French Air Force that fought the Allies in World War II. So these are really just, I recommend them highly. I'm going to put the links at the bottom along with uh, Patreon and merchandise links and things like that. So you can just see where I'm getting my sources from. So now just to you know briefly overview why the French felt that war in the air would be futile. Um, was their belief in Julio Douay's bomber philosophy? And of course, that's a name that if you know a lot about interwar or World War II aviation, it's going to pop up as a little bit of a red flag when it comes to planning. Uh, now, Douay thought that no fighter could intercept a bomber successfully with such frequency that the bomber would actually be stopped from getting through. So cities were his top priority, and he felt that by using incendiary, explosive, and chemical weapons, that the cities would be destroyed and wars would be over. So the French figured that the Germans didn't have any air power, they didn't face any problems with Italy or Spain, and like Britain, they thought that it would be an Anglo-French war if there was going to be one. So by the mid-1930s, of course, they realized that this was wrong. Um, you know, they still had this idea that bombers were always going to get through, uh, whoever was there first was going to win, and that all they had to do was make enough bombers to get by, and that would be it. But they didn't even do that. Uh, by the mid-1930s, the French had moved from a poorly organized, expensive, and ramshackle program of bomber development and light fighters that were not much more advanced than fighters in 1919 were to these programs of trying to find a jack-of-all-trade aircraft. Now, 
I'm going to get into this deeper with my video on the uh, Amio 143, which um, I wanted to cover also some of the Potez designs when I do that. But for right now, we're just going to talk about the philosophy, strategy, and um, really just the industrial um, approach to aviation in France during the time. Now, the French ideal bomber was supposed to be the strategic bomber that could also be a maritime bomber, uh, do overland reconnaissance, ocean reconnaissance, observation, uh, operate as a transport, a utility aircraft, a, a, a turnip greenhouse, a, anything. And they wanted the biggest bang for their buck because they were certainly broke. And the fighters they were producing were pursuit aircraft meant to take on other fighters because escorts they thought would be useless. In fact, they didn't even plan to escort their bombers at all. The, uh, which was, of course, not really that different from American, British, or even German ideas of how bombing would go about. Now, the tactical bombers were supposed to be these lingering interceptors that would also spend hours circling the frontier, waiting for bombers to come, uh, but also have versions that were going to be interdiction, army cooperation, strike, anti-shipping. You get the idea. So the problem with all of this was that nothing was really happening. So the French in the late 20s, you know, they had the Reef War in the Maghrib, and they saw that the air operations there demonstrated the great war designs that they were kind of still sticking with were still effective. And they liked that. It offered financial and emotional security. You know, they figured if we can use outdated designs successfully in our colonial wars, then what else do we really need? And, you know, this would be the catalyst, though, of new developments after the 1920s that kind of restarted a completely stagnant French aviation sector. Unfortunately, the idea that colonial warfare needed simple craft and war in Europe was a bomber war that they thought would you know, be over in no time, uh, flew them against Britain and you know, extraordinarily deadly and focused on cities. But this idea, they would have to learn the hard way, was very wrong because flying against the Bedouins was not the same as flying against the Bosch. And the French designs in service in the early 30s, for example, included like the uh, Gnupot de Lage in ID 62. It was a sesquiplane that would amazingly still be in service right up to 1939. Uh, the Blériot Spad S510 was their last biplane. And just to show you kind of the time frames of where things moved, it first flew in 1933, but it didn't enter service until 1936. So you figure by 1936, yeah, aviation had changed a great deal from, say, 1930. The Devoitin D-500 first flew in 1932. Uh, it entered service 1935. And it even saw combat in, I think, one escadrille during World War II. Uh, mostly used as a trainer and colonial fighter by then. But still, you're looking at something that looks like a racing plane, if anything. Uh, open cockpit, not even a contemporary of, say, the Claude or the P-26 when it comes to design or performance. And yet this was their primary fighter through the mid-1930s. And she was tremendously obsolete uh, before the war even came around. Had war started um, at the Munich conference, France would have been more outclassed than she was in 1940. Now, the uh, another example of this, where you have a contemporary of other aircraft with similar designs, but nowhere near the performance, would be the uh, Marine Saunier MS-225. It was a parasol wing fighter. And only 75 were ever built. There's a lot of these small batches that the French had. Um, they were built beginning in 1932, out of service by 1937. I mean, this was a plane that clearly belonged to the late 20s, not to the mid-30s, even though the parasol seemed to be France's, I guess you could say, transitional stage of fighter development. And you see this also in the Loire, 46, uh, the Loire 46, Apologize if I slip into my first language. Um, only 61 of these were ever built. They were introduced in 1936, and it kind of fit in more with the PZL P7 or the Icolos IK2, the uh, contemporary gull-winged parasol fighters, but it was so underpowered and just unreliable that she was out of service only two years later. Uh, they were sent to be trainers, and a single unit flew them in combat in 1940, but they really didn't even compare to other outdated fighters of which they were contemporaries. And then you know, beyond fighters, we look at the bombers and they just were not produced in numbers either. Sorry, only 200 of the 332 Bloch MB 200 bombers made would ever see service in France. 
Now, the others were made for export to Czechoslovakia, and they ended up in Bulgarian service, if I remember correctly. Um, but this aircraft was introduced in 1935, and she was still in colonial units in the Levant in World War II. But she only had a bomb load of 2,600 pounds and maximum speed of 177 miles per hour. She was barely defended. Um, and you can see just from the design that there's really nothing advanced about her. You figure this is a contemporary of, say, the Junkers bombers in Spain. They were seeing service. Heinkel was developing the 111. Uh, I think the DO-217 would have been, or rather the DO-15 definitely would have been on the drawing board. And just off the top of my head, I'll correct myself if I'm wrong. Uh, but you look at that, and then you look at the the uh, the Block MB-200, and you just wonder where the French were thinking. Did they, they even look at their neighbors? And then, you know, of the Falman F-220, which was you know, definitely one of the better known aircraft, these were made from 1932 to 1938. Now, that may sound like it's a long production line, but only 80 were produced. So over six years, you have 80 produced. That's the, the numbers just aren't there. And Falman could have built them all probably within a year if they wanted to. But we're going to get that into why that's not the case later. But these were really not much better than the uh, the Block MB-200s, and they did carry about 5,000 pounds of bombs. So they were you know, better bombers in the sense of payload, but they were awkward and slow, and the airframes were vulnerable, and they were barely defended. They had lots of glass um, for to meet observation duties. They were you know, supposed to be these long-range reconnaissance bomber patrols. Like, you know, like I said, the you know, turnip glass greenhouse. And uh, they weren't. They just ended up being these white elephants. And uh, you know, then you have aircraft like the uh, Potez 540. And uh, this was, a, again, a jack-of-all-trades, multi-role, awkward thing uh, introduced in 1934. And she couldn't even reach 200 miles an hour. Now, if the bomber was always supposed to get through, this wasn't that bomber. So the Spanish Republican pilots flying her called her the flying coffin. Um, said she wasn't even fit for reconnaissance and observation duties. And you know, budgets being what they were, even this mess stayed in service until World War II as a transport and paratroop carrier. You know, there were also literally scores of aircraft, which only a single prototype was submitted to the government. Companies were financially broke. Um, their morale was certainly destroyed. You know, they didn't know if they were going to survive. But they knew they could get subsidies for producing even just one aircraft, even if it wasn't chosen. So those designs that were selected, though, even then the contracts weren't filled for years. And parts and engines were always you know, wanting. So production of 100 examples of a single aircraft took nice years and years, like we said before about the FAMA. And you know those that you know were produced were produced as if it was an art. You know these were, there was no mass manufacturing in these factories. These were being produced in the same way that aircraft, say even before the Great War, were produced. You know during the Great War the French knew how to kick out aircraft. These weren't that. You know everything was a safe bet. Everything was milked for all it was worth, and they could get government funds for it, and that was all they needed. It was no. There was no real reason to push a company towards more because they knew the money wasn't there. And deliveries and development were just painfully slow. And even with the 1937-1939 rearmament plans, you know, better aircraft started to come off the drawing boards for sure. And But all that proved was that the French didn't have the industrial output or the organization necessary to meet the most basic of production demands. Now, the nationalization of the aircraft industry certainly did not help the situation. And where other nations set specifications for aircraft and engines that you know, pushed their industries to the limits of their imagination, France myopically worked within their fatalistic, self-induced limitations of current technology. The French felt that it was better to know what, with what one was working than to hope for a more powerful product that yet did not exist. And this led to stagnation in aircraft design and you know, engine design, since existing motors could be produced for innumerable contracts without taking the risk of investing in more advanced research and development. Even great fighters like the Devil 10 D520 were advanced developments of early 1930s aircraft. Ingenuity was not valued, and neither was efficiency or you know, the value that government investment and innovation could really wield. 
unions, political intrigue, xenophobia, socialism. I, I don't like saying it, but it was a matter of the French being France. Now, French is my first language. I love French culture and their contributions to the arts. But the Third Republic was, frankly, a total, absolute, abysmal mess at best. And, you know, it's just a matter of historical fact that they were changing governments all the time. Ministers were in unstable positions. There were riots. There were strikes. There were you know, the far right and the far left going at it. You had monarchists still around, you know, with their influence. And it's all the reasons why I'm happy to be Canadian and have a Canadian accent when I speak French. The, uh, now, the military, though, beyond this was stuck in the middle here. And they were hamstrung by tight budgets, this, uh, you know, string after string of socialist governments that answered to labor more than to the needs of the nation when it came to defense. Um, development just couldn't keep up with the changes in government. And France had been resting on her laurels for 15 to almost 20 years. And the roots of developmental failures in the mid and late 1930s and the failure to overcome the quagmire of the 20s and early 30s really find their place in the ministry of Pierre Coe. Now, he was a socialist, anti-war activist who was active with the Comintern and the Communist Party of France. Um, he held the position of Minister of the Air in Daladier's radical popular front government, as long as the subsequent uh, Chauton and Blum popular front governments, and then again with Deladier on his return and Reynaud. And, you know, the guy just kind of was one of those politicians that was a rarity in France. He kept a stable position. Now, when I say he was anti-war, I don't mean that he would have been a really bad minister for air because he thought all war was bad. No, he was anti-war because he understood it in Marxist terms. He saw war as the manipulation of the working class to fight the owners of the means of production through bourgeois nationalism and religion, etc. That was hard to say. So, he was not anti-military at all. Um, if anything, he was definitely aware of the need for defense and pro-military. Uh, he saw the growth of civil aviation in Germany for what it was. He initiated a program known as Aviation Populaire, and it was along the same lines as what Germany was doing with their civil aviation programs. Only instead of working within the industry and trying to build alliances, he targeted the working class because he felt that it would unite them against German nationalism. Unfortunately, you know, he also felt that this great unity of the workers would end up with better production of armaments. And this culminated with nationalizing the entire aviation industry. Uh, Bloch was the last company to be taken in, and you know, the others just kind of fell in turn, as I'll describe. But they were each assigned geographic responsibility, and you know each of these little five multi-firm companies were supposed to organize production and all this other stuff. So you're just adding another layer of bureaucracy and removing any reason for competition. As Edgar Milod wrote in the Annals of Collective Economy in 1939, I think it was uh, May to August is the issue, just before the outbreak of the war, they saw that the nationalization of the industry had crippled the French military. And these are other European powers writing this. They looked at the French military aviation scene and they just saw nothing but disaster. And this is after Munich. This is after France was trying to get her game together. And it totally failed. They had no idea what they were doing. Um, and everybody just looked at the nationalization plan and couldn't make heads or tails of it. So Cote honestly believed that by nationalizing the aviation industry, he would streamline it by removing businessmen. And he felt that the, you know, these businessmen were holding back the country's innovations. And of course, he didn't think the government was behind this. Of course not. Um, and he, you know, he thought that it was preventing the worker from optimizing the means of production or whatever he thought that was. But these five mixed companies, um, most are still around today. Uh, you have the uh, Société Nationale de Construction de Ronautique, Du Nord, uh, de l'Ouest, du Sud-Ouest, du Sud-Est, and du Centre. And you know, that's really the these five I, that were supposed to manage each company's operations in that geographic area. And this was all within six months of the change of government that had followed the June 1936 national strikes that basically crippled France. Um, he had convinced the right that this streamlining measure was supposed to prevent strikes, promote production, and you know, he basically kind of shanghaied them into this. 
and he bought the firms out for 270 million francs, which he asked for 400 million. So you can imagine that with a 130 million franc difference, it took a lot of doing and the budget was already kind of off to a bad start. But, you know, Coat really did think that he could make this efficient, modern arsenal of the air that would meet all of the government's needs. And he looked at the munitions industry that had been nationalized. And, you know, he figured he could do the same with the air. Except making airplanes is a great deal more complex than making shells, artillery, and small arms. And, I mean, not to say the quality in French small arms and artillery was that great moving towards the 1940s or that there was any real innovation, but you have to design an aircraft with qualities that you're not going to see in the munitions industry regarding engineering and innovation and just the concept of warfare. You know, that the airplane is a tool just like the rifle. Now, I mean, I did competitive rifle. I love, you know, guns and shooting and all that, but there's a very large difference between designing a service rifle and designing a new fighter. Um, and he just didn't understand that. He thought that nationalizing it would be as easy as flicking a switch and he'd get mass production of a great weapon. And that's just not how aviation works, especially when you're 10 years behind the times. So he found that the businesses though, were willing to sell their controlling stock. To businessmen, this offered a little bit of stability and it meant that they didn't really have to compete on contracts. So the men that he hired to run the companies were a whole nother affair. I mean, these had access to personal salaries of over 300,000 francs. They had a direct line into the cabinet. Um, and they had the funds to rebuild, decentralize, and buy privately owned machinery. They had no worries to have to pay overhead for social security, healthcare, payroll, um, investment capital, it was all government money. And you know, when it's not your money, you tend to spend more of it. With They had a nearly guaranteed 10% profit built into production. Uh, for mass production models, it was a 15% profit built into every aircraft. So this was very popular, and the firms of Mohen Saunier, Amiot, Netequer, Godou, Devasseur, and Quadron were all just bowled over. They said, this is great, we're going to make money. Uh, Potez and Bloch were Coates' favorites, and he, this is where the political ties kind of come in. He allowed them to continue as private entities who had leased themselves to the government. So he looked at this and he thought, well, on paper, there's no way that this can fail. But you know, people said that about the Soviet Union, too. And beyond this, you have the engine industry. Now, we've talked about aircraft, but without an engine, the aircraft doesn't work. And the engine industry had not been privatized, but they were also completely unmotivated. When Co bought minority stocks in Nomejon and uh, Hispano Suiza, his goal was to try to stimulate competition. But with the government owning the stocks and designs not calling for new motors, there was no reason for them to compete or innovate. And each was guaranteed a certain volume of business. Each new specification that came out for a new military aircraft was tailored to existing technology. So you have so many aircraft that are powered by the same motors. Uh, the Hispano Suiza 12X was an underpowered 12 cylinder V, a liquid cooled motor. It was very underpowered. It rarely exceeded 690 horsepower. And the early models were only rated at 500 horsepower. Now the 12Y, which superseded the 12X and was used in more of the, some of the better aircraft that came out uh, towards the late 30s and 1940, um, this produced between 900 and 1,000 horsepower, depending on variant, had a supercharger, and it was probably the most popular engine model. But it was inferior to many of the designs being released in the later half of the 1930s in other countries, and it just didn't provide the power necessary for modern fighters, nor was it available in sufficient numbers. They literally did not have engines to put into these aircraft. And knowing that, they simply didn't produce the aircraft. They felt that it was better just to not waste their time building something for which there was no motor, rather than trying to get the government to, you know, build more or, I mean, they did, and I'll get into that in a minute, but, you know, or even just try to build up business. They figured that they were happy the way they were, and in the budget-tight years where they knew the government was not going to spend more than they had to, it was a safe bet. But, you know, ironically, 
some development did happen in smaller engines, like the lightweight vanilla 12R3. It was this air-cooled inverted V12 made of two other motors put together. And it only produced 500 horsepower, but it was reliable. Had a supercharger, um, parts were available, and it was powerful enough to drive light fighters like the Quadclone uh, C714. And But even then, it was still running short in supply because there just wasn't the manufacturing technology there. The industrial standards were not there. There was no quality assurance, mass production, and lean thinking were just foreign. Um, not to be you know, the uh, out of time, but you know, of course, lean thinking nowadays, we think everywhere. Of course, that's a much later idea, but still, the just general efficiency of the mass production system never really hit France. And still, though, it's a private motor industry. Why was everything so difficult to produce? And this goes right back to France's socialist ideology at the time. The radicals, the socialists, the communists, they were all in this popular front governments. And one of the groups that they really wanted to placate were the labor unions. And the labor unions utterly refused to work more than 40 hours. I mean, nowadays, of course, French labor laws are almost a joke in many places. You know, show up on Tuesday and then you're off for three months. Kind of got its start here. And, you know, the unions just didn't want to work. They said, look, this is, these are our hours. This is what we went on general strike four years ago. I mean, France was at the brink of revolution at the time. And they just weren't there for them. So companies had to work within restrictions that they never really considered before. You know, you, even in the 1930s, 1940s, you figure you, you offer overtime, you hire more people. And it just, there was no possibility for any of that. Um, so they were stuck with the workforce they had and they were unmotivated. Quality wasn't on their mind and you know, just really much, too much politics in the workplace, to put it bluntly. So, you know, even as Germany's advances just stared them in the face, you know, right across the border in Spain, they could see what other European countries are doing. They just really didn't react. I mean, even after Munich, you saw a pickup, yeah, but it wasn't the drastic change that you would think something like the Munich crisis would have led to. So even by the outbreak of the war, unions were still afraid of competition that might come from importing designs or engines from America. They refused to allow the importation of large numbers of foreign fighters. Um, the Hawk 75 is the only one that comes to mind as a successful foreign plane in French service. The French government was too cash poor to afford much of the American aircraft for sale, and none of them were really that modern anyway. And you know, they were victims of their own planning. Uh, Coat, who had actually been sent to procure American aircraft as part of the, the French uh, delegation there, Coat just stared in awe at you know, what a totally private industry could do and how the American aircraft industry was modern and innovative and just this giant behemoth of, you know, of industrial might and even then, in America, we still had organized labor. We had, you know, a lot of war production with some of the best paying and but most secure jobs, and yet they were also the most innovative and the most, you know, technologically progressive. And he just couldn't wrap his head around that. He thought he was completely right in his decisions to nationalize everything and to cater to the unions. And, you know, it really was exactly the opposite of what France needed if they were going to face the Germans successfully. The uh, And he would... He never did regret what he did, though. He he really did think that this was, you know, the best that he could do. Um, he continued as a politician in French far left parties, um, even into the post war decades. He won the Stalin Peace Prize in the nineteen fifties. But he's a perfect example of how France lacked the introspection necessary to improve herself. And you know, she never really criticized herself and never looked at herself deeply enough to say. This is what we need to change. And it's that kind of docile acceptance of how things are that would end up being their defeat. Um, and you see this in their armor, their artillery. Their, France was like this in a lot of places. But in the air war, it was particularly bold of them not to keep up with the world. Um, they had many, many opportunities to improve their aviation industry. Instead, they just trusted that Germany would never rearm as they did. And even when they saw it, they didn't really address it. 
They thought that a war with Britain would be awkward and brutal exchange of bombers loaded with explosives and gas and incendiary. And it was a safe bet just to set specifications based on current technology instead of investing in the aviation industry to stimulate competition and development. You know, it would take the industry over in a giant waste of money that stymied it, if anything. And it was placating this volatile and unstable labor sector that was unlike really what any other country had to deal with at the time. The French could have produced small numbers of steadily improving fighters and bombers to keep up with technology. I mean, after all, that's basically what the United States did. But instead, they just wasted millions of francs on producing individual examples of mediocre aircraft that went nowhere, while buying aircraft that would be obsolescent before their production runs were even complete. Um, the successes of the Vichy Air Force would be with the few good models that survived in 1940, and of course with American Hawks. Um, but June 1940 was not so much a failure of the pilots giving you know, dated and ill-designed aircraft meant for a defensive war based on 1920s and 30s theories, but rather it was really the fault of politicians who sold them short you know, all through the governments of the 1920s and 30s that did everything in their power to retard the progress of aviation industries and you know, commanders who were never trained to fight against a highly advanced enemy with a better supply system a realistic outlook on modern warfare and modern technology. In short, 1940 was a thorough cleaning of house for France, and the mess that was swept away had been there for over a decade, and they could have been cleaned out any time France wanted. But instead, it was just a giant waste of money that landed them nowhere. And I think that any time that a country just sits there and rests on its laurels and doesn't develop and doesn't innovate, that's what you're going to get. And I think we see this with you know, the, the Red Air Force in the opening parts of the war. We see this with Italy, definitely. Um, you know, just the money wasn't there. And either, in Italy's case, of course, it's a little bit different. Um, they did innovate. They did develop. Just it was underfunded. And that's because they didn't have the funds in the first place. Uh, Britain, you see this a little bit in the 1930s with kind of, which is hovering around small design improvements. And then you have France. And France just blew the kettle. There was, there was nothing there. So... Well, that's all for this little video. Um, I know I didn't do the, you know, like I said, the usual video, but with being just back, it wasn't the easiest to, you know, put together something real quick. And I just wanted to put out, you know, a product, really. I just want to keep things moving. Um, so the next real video that's going to be coming is on the Coast Guard from 1917 to 1946. Um, then the video on the Amyo 143. And of course, again, thank you for your support. Those of you who buy merchandise, make donations, uh, support me on Patreon. It really is such a help. Um, but most of all, I just look forward to your comments and questions. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell for updates, share it with your friends. Um, just, you know, I'm very happy to have support right now. And until next time, this is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Take care. <laughs>